Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program. My name is Marcel Tenberg, Managing Director at Bank of America Merrill Lynch in San Francisco, and I'm also a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. I'm pleased to serve as the chair for today's program. This program is virtual, but the Commonwealth Club has begun in-person programming at its headquarters, and we expect to do many in-person programs in the months to come. To learn more about the club's in-person programs and how to become a member, visit the club's website at www.commonwealthclub.org, www.commonwealthclub.org. Today's program, the annual Walter E. Hoadley Bank of America Economic Forecast, is named in honor of Dr. Walter Hoadley, a former president of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors and former chief economist at Bank of America. Bank of America Merrill Lynch is the sponsor for today's program, and we will begin with a macroeconomic overview from Dr. Michael Boskin, a world-renowned economist and former chair of President George H.W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors. He will speak for about 20 minutes about the state of the economy and what we might expect in the year ahead. Then, after Dr. Boskin's remarks, we will have a special in-depth panel discussion focused on key economic issues, including inflation, supply chain, and the workforce. There's obviously a lot going on right now, locally, nationally, and globally, and there will be much to discuss. The conversation will be led by Mary Huss, president and publisher of the San Francisco Business Times. She will be in conversation with several key professionals who understand these impacts on the economy from different standpoints. Joining Mary for this panel discussion will be Dr. Noel Hasegaba, the Deputy Executive Director of the Port of Long Beach, the second largest port in the United States of America. Hannah Kane, the President and CEO of Alum, a global supply chain company. And Sarah Bond, the Vice President and John and Louise Bryson Chair in Policy Research and Senior Fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California, who has written extensively on the impact of inflation on California workers and families. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Boskin, who is the Tully M. Friedman Professor of Economics and Wolford Family Hoover Institute Senior Fellow at Stanford University. He served as Chairman of President George H.W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors from 1989 to 1993. He has advised four presidents of the United States and multiple prime ministers of the United Kingdom, chancellors of Germany, and premiers of China. He's also chaired the highly influential Blue Ribbon Commission on the Consumer Price Index, whose report has transformed the way that governmental statistical agencies around the world measure inflation, GDP, and productivity, all critical to the issues we face today. Dr. Boskin is also the president of the Corrett Foundation and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His column on economics and politics is syndicated in 145 countries. Before turning it over to Dr. Boskin, a quick note to everyone watching. If you have any questions for Dr. Boskin or any of our later speakers, please put them into the YouTube chat box. All questions will be shared with moderator Mary Huss during the panel discussion portion of the program. And now over to Dr. Boskin. Thank you for that gracious introduction. And it's always a delight 
to be here at the Commonwealth Club, even virtually, uh, and to speak at, some, uh, at an event named after my old friend, Walter Hoadley, uh, who was a terrific economist and a terrific uh, president of the Commonwealth Club. What I'm gonna do today, as we'll see on the next slide, is try to convey very quickly with the aid, uh, with the aid of a variety of pictures and slides, which I will go through rapidly, but are just meant to be a visual presentation of what I'm talking about. And you can look at them later on at your convenience. Um, give you some thoughts on the short and long-term economic outlook on growth, inflation, jobs, what the effects of COVID might be and Omicron and the new sub-variant of Omicron may be. Uh, and I also at the end wanna talk for a few minutes about Americans long run pessimism. In polls, not just recently, uh, and not just during the pandemic or during the global financial crisis, but for a couple of decades, Americans have turned from their usual optimism about the future to pessimism. And they're not the only ones, but Americans now, a large majority say that they think that their children and grandchildren will be worse off than they have been. A uh, tremendous change from the typical American optimism. And it's not just in America, that's going on in many parts of the world. It's particularly true among middle-aged and older workers and, and citizens, but it's also true among the young. America's young are less pessimistic. They're, they're pessimistic, but not quite as pessimistic as their parents' generation uh, on the one hand, but they are more pessimistic than those in many other countries, especially developing countries, which tend not to be as pessimistic. So I wanna talk about that. And we'll, in the course of that, we'll talk about the Fed and its pos possible normalization of its balance sheet and starting to raise interest rates. We'll talk about the problems on the fiscal side with large deficits and a tremendously uh, elevated national debt relative to the size of the economy and what must will likely happen to that. I'll touch on regulation and trade and geopolitical issues very briefly because those might affect things as well. So let me just give you a quick rundown of where we are uh, and where we're expected to go. We ended 2021 and began 2022 on what appeared to be a fairly strong note, a very strong jobs report this morning, stronger than people expected given Omicron uh, caused a lot of people to be at home in the week that the survey occurred in January. We also had a very strong fourth quarter uh, GDP report. Uh, the economy grew at a very strong pace, but about two thirds of it was businesses accumulating inventories. And in December, consumer spending actually fell. So I think it's fair to say, while there's some optimism that the economic recovery will continue pretty decently uh, in the short run, uh, there are some warning signs and then there are some risks. And of course, uh, inflation started to accelerate. We'll go into that in more detail in a few moments. It's also important to realize that more or less the same thing is going on everywhere. Orange is, is last year. This is the blue is the forecast for this year. The IM International Monetary Fund has been lowering its forecast, particularly for the US and China, but for many other countries, all of whom are expected to grow more slowly, Brazil uh, barely at all uh, in this year. However, uh, Japan and Germany are exceptions because they had such weak 2021s, uh, touching on negative territory briefly. So uh, that's a broader world outlook. It's important because that affects our trade and financial flows. If we look at what the Federal Reserve is anticipating, if uh, from the left, we see the actual growth from 2016, it's accelerating in 2017, 18, pretty decent in 19. And then of course the collapse in 2020 with COVID, the lockdowns, government ordered lockdowns and a lot of other restrictions that had people at home. And 2021, we grew quite strongly. However, uh, there was a late year inventory buildup and consumer spending decline, raise issues about what does that mean for the future? Is this temporary or not? The Fed's forecast for this year is for 4% growth. Uh, those bars indicate the range of the forecasts uh, that are pre presented by individual uh, members at the FOMC meetings. Uh, and then they expect growth to fall to 2% in 23 and four. And they actually think that our long run growth prospects are below 2%, as does the Congressional Budget Office. That's down from an historic 3% for most of the World War II period, partly due to slower growth of the labor force heavily due to demography uh, and very modest expectations of productivity. If that continued for some time, growing at sub 2% after we were used to 3%, uh, despite the labor force adjustment, uh, that would be a big telling thing on a very pessimistic future relative to our 
post-World War II history. Uh, the employment situation has rebounded. I remember at the beginning of all this, I'd be on TV or the radio and people asked me, do I expect a U-shape or a V-shape? And I quipped, I thought we'd have kind of a tilted square root sign recovery. Um, that didn't catch on, <laughs> I think, because not many people remember what square root signs look like. But in any event, that's more or less what happened. We had a very strong early recovery uh, in 2020, and then it leveled off in 2021, but continued to grow. And we've had as still adding a lot of jobs. We're currently about 3 million short of the peak in February of 2020, but probably about half of that is due to more, uh, more elderly workers not staying in the labor force. People are unlikely to return as uh, wages rise and uh, more openings occur. Uh, there are, most of those won't come back, but maybe about half of them are gettable. And we have a chance of having them return to the labor market, which would be good for the firms looking for workers and be good for the overall growth of the economy that we could sustain sizable growth for this year. Uh, starting in the spring of 2021, we had the unusual situation of having a growing yawning gap between the job openings listed by American uh, firms uh, and the number of unemployed people. Now, of course, as all those unemployed people aren't in the same places with the same skills as all of those jobs, uh, but many of them are, and so we have ample opportunity. And firms, especially small businesses, are scrambling to stay open, to work full shifts. Uh, we see, for example, restaurants have reopened and can't staff, so they're only open on weekends or four days a week, things of that sort. And that's partly a supply chain problem, partly a supply of work and workers problem, as people are staying home a bit for caution still because of Omicron, schools not full, some schools not fully reopened uh, and the like, but that's a mix that other people will talk about, supply chain and so on. It's important to know that the massive fiscal stimulus, trillions and trillions of dollars for in uh, the spring of 2020 through uh, December of 2020 was mostly saved. Uh, there was a great humanitarian need. And of course, at the beginning, there was incredible uncertainty about what would happen. We had lockdowns. We had massive numbers of people losing their jobs, were at home. Uh, they couldn't go out. Only essential workers are supposed to be not on lockdown. We had this massive stuff. And so a massive number of people who needed help in a very short term. We didn't always get it to them in time. California's Employment Development Department was a uh, catastrophe in that regard but we had lots of people needed help. So I'll cut some slack, even though I thought some of these programs were poorly targeted and were likely not to work very well. The massive response was designed to put a floor under things so they didn't really get totally out of hand long-term. Uh, so cut, cut them a little slack for that, but most of it was saved. We can see the elevated saving rate. The saving rate is generally around seven, six or 7%. It's back to that now, but all this area on the center right and right of the graph, um, are those elevated saving rates, we accumulate all that. It's a couple of trillion bucks, uh, that excess saving that consumers have that strengthens their balance sheet and enables them to spend going into the rest of this year and next, uh, drawing down that saving if, uh, if they choose to do so. So they have the firepower. That's a good sign for consumers. If we look also at the labor market being strong, those are traditionally good, good signs for consumption in the economy, which is two thirds of the economy. But unfortunately, starting in the spring, we had a massive increase in inflation. Inflation had been so quiescent um, in the run up to this for years under the Fed's 2% target uh, for its preferred measure of inflation. What do we have? We had a big increase. It's now running 7% overall in the, with the consumer price index and 5.5% if we strip out the volatile food and energy part. Although obviously food and energy are what people pay at the supermarket of the gas pump every day or every week. And so those, those are the most salient prices, even if other prices haven't risen as much. It's hoped that energy and food will come down some and will take some of the pressure off. But the problem is that inflation has now spread to many, many more goods uh, through freight costs, labor costs, lots of other things going up. We've seen inflation become very broad based. So it's unlikely to abate on a widespread basis very quickly. Will it continue? That's a key, uh, key question the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world have to ask, and they're all changing their policy uh, or in the process of it. This is the total assets the Fed, Fed holds. It has mortgage-backed securities and it has 
uh, treasury bills and bonds and so on. And it soared during the financial crisis and great recession on the far left here, shaded areas meaning recessions. It then was pretty stable at a little over $4 trillion and then it's basically doubled since then. In fact, in the last year when the real estate market's been uh, white hot, the Fed was buying $40 billion of mortgage-backed securities a month, uh, probably over-insuring against a problem. And the question is what will happen now? They've announced the taper, they've started it. Uh, they're buying less and less. And then it becomes a question of will, will they just stay there? Will they roll over the when stuff comes due and it matures? They sell it off. Uh, selling it off at a modest pace would probably put them in the marketplace at, at fairly low levels for many years. Uh, but that's probably what's going to happen barring a, another sharp downturn. The same is true of interest rates. The Federal Reserve lowered its key measure of uh, its key interest rate target, the federal funds rate. Uh, the banks charge each other on uh, borrowing overnight and close to zero. It did the same in the aftermath of the Great Recession in December of uh, 20, 2008, during the Great Recession, I should say. Uh, it lowered it. It was expected to stay there for nine months as the economy recovered. It actually stayed there for seven years. It then started up again and then back down to zero. And the question is, at what pace, how often, how much? Uh, until the last month or so, markets were expecting three rate increases next year. That's probably up to four and maybe five and several more in 2023, barring a uh, substantial, really sl sluggish economy or uh, tipping into negative territory, a recession. Let's go on. Now, important in all this is inflation forecasts. What is likely to happen in the future? Uh, for 2022 and 2023, these three bars, blue, gold, and purple, are from the blue chip forecasters, 50 private forecasters who are, do this sort of thing for a living in private firms, ac academe, think tanks, et cetera, agencies and the like. And so the blue is the average, which would be uh, well over 4%, close to 5% this year. And, uh, and the, the bottom is about 3.8 or seven, and the top is, uh, quite a bit higher, five, five and a half, five point six percent 5.6%, if we take the top 10 and bottom 10. Now that's all a modest range. Let's hope we're toward the bottom of that and let's hope it's not above the high end. Um, but if we look at two other sets of information, uh, one is what financial markets are expecting, which we can garner from the relationship of, of uh, interest rate paid on treasury inflation protected securities, and traditional bonds, which aren't adjusted for inflation and bills and notes and so on. We, we take a look at that and that's about 2.6%, pretty much what the Fed is expecting. But if we look at what people are expecting, we take the University of Michigan Survey of Consumer Expectations, they're expecting almost 5% inflation this year. So if that's what they're expecting and they behave accordingly, and they start as, as workers start demanding enough higher wages above productivity, uh, that we wind up in a situation where we get an interaction of wages and prices, firms and people uh, as consumers and as workers starting to anticipate high inflation. It can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's what's important not to happen if we want to get inflation under control. If we want to keep inflation expectations and tech and uh, Fed techno jargon well anchored at uh, close to 2% or not much above it. Let's go on. However, what happened was uh, in March of 2021, the new administration proposed a very large so-called coronavirus relief and rescue plan. President Biden called it his American Rescue Plan. Uh, whatever you think of the components in it was on top of many trillions of dollars in 2020 at a time when the economy was getting pretty close to its potential output. And so we had a stimulus that was quite a bit larger than the, uh, than the output gap that economists look to. And as you start getting close to that uh, output gap shrinking, you're going to get more and more inflationary pressures, uh, as, as my former student Larry Summers, uh, Obama's chief economic advisor and President Clinton's Treasury Secretary, warned that this was too large. And indeed, it looks like that has been the case. There are other causes, the supply chain you'll hear more about in a moment, and also, um, also the comparison to low prices during the COVID period for some commodities. Let's go on. 
Okay, now let's turn to the longer term. Uh, my guess is, or my best judgment, the wide prior, and whenever I make these kinds of statements, I try to remember uh, the, the sage advice of America's greatest philosopher, New York Yankee a legend, Yogi Berra, when he said, uh, predictions are pretty tough, especially about the future. So uh, you know, my basic outlook is for the economy doing pretty well, but inflation pressures being stubborn. Some of this is not going to be transitory and it's going to require the Fed to raise interest rates and, uh, and do other things. And it's going to require some attention on the fiscal side, not to add a lot more excess government spending on top of what's already under uh, un in train um, to try to keep inflation pressures from getting out of hand. It's hard to think of something to be worse coming out of this than getting back into a 1970s style high inflation. And for perspective for those youngsters in the crowd, President Nixon, a conservative Republican, imposed wage and price controls on the economy when inflation got up to 4%. So inflation in these ranges is, no, is a serious problem and uh, caused a lot of distortions and disruptions, particularly for the least fortunate among us. So what's gonna happen as we come out of this? What's the exit? Well, we have stubborn inflation, secular stagnation, stagflation, the combination of uh, a recession and inflation that happened in 1980 and cost President Carter his job. You may remember misery indexes that were the sum of inflation and unemployment rates. Uh, but deeply important over the coming decade or two, what's gonna, what you're gonna experience later in your life and what your children will experience, will productivity enhancing technology gains continue to improve the economy or will they weaken their power to increase productivity? That's a big debate going on right now in economics. We have pessimists thinking that all the, the internet stuff, the AI, the machine learning, all that sort of stuff is kind of cool, but it's nothing like electricity, aviation, uh, all those things that enabled tremendous productivity growth in the first 60 years or so of the, uh, of the last century. On the other side are those who think AI and uh, machine learning and all these other things uh, um, will be so revolutionary that they will greatly expand productivity. Uh, they may make some uh, workers redundant as the technology has in the past, but technology and globalization have been hard on labor markets, especially for uh, uh, less and medium skilled uh, workers, blue collar workers, particularly uh, in the industrial Midwest, the United States and the Midlands in England and the like, uh, as millions and millions and millions of workers in previously communist countries, particularly China after Deng Xiaoping opened it up, were enabled to start helping to produce traded goods, which put pressure on wages here. I think that's probably in the sixth or seventh inning. It's not in the ninth inning. It's not in the third inning, uh, but that will probably continue a bit. But if you add that to demography, rising life expectancy of the elderly, uh, declining birth uh, fertility rates, the baby boom working its way through now, retiring, et cetera. Is that gonna overwhelm our fiscal and economic and global position? We're going from three workers to two, uh, for, uh, for uh, three, three retirees to two for every uh, worker. Many other countries, Germany, Japan, are going to one to one, so they have it harder. Uh, and China will even be older than we will in terms of the fraction over 65 in a generation. So this is confronting everybody. Uh, but will that pressure on labor markets abate? I think we're going to need more workers in the future, as I'll say in a moment. Uh, and that gets me to the labor force. We're leaving too many young, youngsters uh, behind. Our schools are not delivering. It's not just the schools. It's parental background. It's resources. It's a lot of other social ills that cause problems. We're leaving too many of our potential workers and our, our fellow citizens behind. Uh, not getting a decent education and leaving them more or less permanently disenfranchised from sharing in our growing economy in a significant way. We do a much better job on that. And when we have enough workers, our demography suggests we're going to be short workers in the future, which means we're going to have, some, have an intelligent reform of our immigration system because we're going to have to have some, uh, substantial legal immigration, perhaps greatly, more greatly focused on skills that we need. And then finally, for a couple more, we have had an energy revolution in North America brought about by fracking uh, and, sh and shale. And while this is controversial, uh, obviously, in environmental concerns, the production of natural gas 
has actually subbing out coal has been the only way we've actually made major reductions in our greenhouse gas emissions. And this revolution has been the biggest geopolitical change in our favor since the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, because it, it reduced the power of OPEC with us at one point. We became the largest oil and gas producer and the marginal supplier. And um, it enabled us to have an opportunity to export a lot of natural gas and decrease Western Europe's dependency on Russia for natural gas, which is horrible for the world and Western Europe and us. Uh, but that has not happened as we've, for, uh, in my view, uh, legitimate concerns, but uh, overly enthusiastic restrictions uh, have tried to limit this in the United States. And I think we need to have a more balanced discussion of that. And that's important for the environment as well as the economy. If we don't have a strongly growing economy, environmental concerns will be at the bottom of the list as they are in every poll that's conducted in poor economic times, the environment falls from being one of the top several to being at the bottom. So we need to balance our economy and our environment to make the progress we need on both fronts in some sensible way. And then of course there are geopolitical tensions, trade balances and the like. Uh, it wouldn't take a war, uh, it wouldn't take a, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Uh, it would, all it would take, for example, would be for the Chinese to launch a cybersecurity attack on the Chinchu Park, where Taiwan's semiconductor produces a majority of the world's advanced chips. That would cause the current supply chain problems on semiconductors to pale in comparison. So fingers crossed, nothing like that happens. And then of course, are democracy and robust capitalism ultimately compatible? Can we get enough people sharing in the, in the uh, growth and, and performance of the economy so that we don't try to have uh, move to a European style social welfare state and provide such wide uh, liberal benefits uh, in terms of the size and who they apply to that we wind up slowing the growth of the economy with very high taxes to deal with our high debt and the future impending imbalances in social security and Medicare. Each of these is gonna complex to manage uh, you know, they sound difficult and they will be. If you look at any time in our past, we've had a similar list. Go back to 1960 or 1980 or 2000, you'd see a similar list. Uh, and we managed to work our way through it because say, we kept our economy predominantly a flexible market economy. Uh, while the hand of government grew from time to time, it didn't surge into European uh, uh, style levels or those in uh, Scandinavia and the like. Uh, we managed to keep that more or less balanced, but we constantly have pressure of government, federal, state, local, uh, here and around the world, by the way, to be more and more things to more and more people. And, and increasingly, it's doing that ineffectively, inefficiently, and incompetently. Uh, and California, sadly, is a, a case of point. We need governments to do the functions we really need them to do and do them well, adequately funded. And uh, that'll be my last pitch to say, I'm cautiously optimistic we'll be able to do that, uh, it's something we've always managed to do in the past. That's no guarantee in the future. There'll be bumps along the road, but I'm always, I always take uh, particular solace in Winston Churchill's deep insight into America when he said, uh, you can count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. So we're gonna get through this and, and we're all gonna need to participate in doing this and make our economy uh, more equitable, more efficient, and uh, able to grow with a modest hand of government, modest taxes, and remaining a robust dynamic economy and society. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Boskin, for your insights. They were informative and thought provoking as always. Um, as Michael mentioned, well, actually Michael did not mention, but as was mentioned earlier, I'm Mary Huss, uh, president and publisher of San Francisco Business Times and Silicon Valley Business Journal. And I'm also proud to serve on the Board of Governors of the Commonwealth Club. I'm gonna be moderating the next portion of the program and also Dr. Boskin will come back to you for some of your comments on, on what our panel has to say. Needless to say, this has been a very challenging time for the American economy. And this pandemic is about to hit its two-year mark. Many small businesses, particularly restaurants and the hospitality industry are still not open or have even gone out of business. In January, the stock market had one of its worst months in the past several years. 
And overall, the American economy is growing significantly, but American consumers are experiencing increasing prices across the economy, as, as we just heard. Employees are quitting jobs in record numbers, and employers are competing for workers, raising wages, contributing to inflation. So what's going on um, from the perspective of some of the folks on our panel? Um, a key part of the story, of course, is inflation. That was a central topic of Dr. Boskin's discussion, and we'll continue to focus on this issue with three people who um, are experiencing this from a real world perspective. So I'm pleased to be joined by our three panelists, Dr. Noel Hasigaba, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Port of Long Beach here in California. Long Beach is the second largest port in the country. Ports and backup at ports got an awful lot of attention in 2021. Um, as the year came to a close. And we look forward to hearing what Mr. Hasigaba um, has to say about the outlook at his port and what it means for the American economy. Hannah Kane is the president and CEO of Alum Technologies. Um, it's a global supply chain, chain company that uh, corporations around the globe rely on to get products and materials delivered. As we know, uh, supply chains were deeply impacted by pandemic and labor-related issues in the second half of 2021. So we look forward to hearing from Hannah on how things are going in 2022 and what we can expect in the months to come. And Sarah Bone, Dr. Sarah Bone is the Vice President and John and Louise Bryson Chair in Policy Research and Senior Fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California. Sarah focuses uh, some of her work on the impact of inflation and price increases on workers and families. So I know she's going to have much to add to this conversation about how issues in the labor market are affecting inflation and how this is impacting consumers. So we've asked each of our three panelists to address this question for their opening remarks. So here's the question. Will issues with the supply chain and labor continue to plague the U.S. economy and contribute to inflation? How will that impact consumers? And what solutions should industry and government be undertaking to mitigate the factors that contribute to inflation? And before we get those answers from each of you, um, I want to remind the audience, if you have questions for the panelists, please write them in the YouTube chat box and the questions will be provided to me and I'll do my best to get to as many of them as possible. So let's start with Dr. Hasigaba and welcome. Well, thank you very much, Mary, and good afternoon to all of you who are watching and my uh, fellow panelists. I wanna begin by thanking the Bank of America, Walter E. Hoadley Annual Economic Forecast for inviting me today. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Port of Long Beach, we are the nation's second busiest seaport. And together with the Port of Los Angeles, we make up the San Pedro Bay Ports Complex, the largest in North America and the ninth largest in the world. The supply chain is typically invisible. In the past, uh, people went to the store, they bought a product labeled Made in Japan, and didn't really give much thought to how it got there. Today, the supply chain is very visible. In fact, it's the topic of national news. These days, stories focus on the logjam of vessels and in ports. And I'm sure many of you have seen images of disruption to the global supply chain. No major container freight gateway has been immune to the negative impacts of the global disruption, least of all the nation's largest container port complex here in Southern California. So how did we get here? In one word, it was the pandemic. First, imports dropped when the pandemic shut down manufacturing overseas. But then as manufacturing reopened in Asia and U.S. consumption shifted from services to goods, that triggered an unprecedented volume surge. We went from doom and gloom to fast and furious on the term of a dime. The traditional peaks and valleys of import volume were replaced by a continuous wave of cargo that began in July of 2020 and continued through 2021. As consumers were confined to their homes, they resorted to e-commerce, which served a 24 seven consumer oriented instant delivery mindset. This kept demand high and imports coming. But while orders surged, shortages in workers, warehouse space and equipment, such as chassis, trucks, and trains disrupted the supply chain, causing containers to pile up on port terminals 
and vessels to queue up off the coast of Southern California in record numbers. Speaking of record numbers, 2021 was a record year for the Port of Long Beach. Even as we confronted the supply chain crisis, we still managed to move more containers than ever before. For calendar year 2021, we moved 9.38 million TEU, up nearly 16% over 2020, which was also a record year. And the San Pedro Bay Ports Complex, LA and Long Beach together, we moved 20.1 million TEU in the year 2021. Now, let me just give you an idea of what that looks like. Placed end to end, 20.1 million TU would wrap around the planet Earth three times at the equator. So you can see we moved a lot of cargo and the total dollar value of that is over $400 billion. At the Port of Long Beach, we continue our work to clear the backlog of vessels offshore, which signals that we'll remain moderately busy into the spring. Given our historic volumes in the first half of 2021, will be hard pressed in early 2022 to see more than slow gains until perhaps the fall. But a key factor in how quickly the supply chain recovers will be the residual effects of COVID-19. The impact this will continue to have on the workforce across every segment of the supply chain will affect the nation's goods movement system and the broader economy. And these challenges are not likely to help quell inflation. As long as these challenges persist, consumers will feel the effects of inflation. With supply chain disruptions making front page news, the Port of Long Beach has received a great deal of attention. Just in the past few months, we welcomed Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, Port Envoy John Picari, Governor Gavin Newsom, and U.S. Senator Alex Padilla to our port. The visits underscore the high level support that our port has received throughout the first year of the Biden-Harris administration from our federal and state leadership. We welcome the support of our federal and state partners, a clear sign of investment in the nation's most significant container gateway. The historic $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law will ensure that ports like ours receive the investments they need to support the supply chain of the future. And as I said, we're seeing investment in the nation's ports. Here in Long Beach, our port was recently awarded a $52.3 million grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation's Maritime Administration. Funding from the program is specifically designed for capital improvement projects at U.S. seaports. This grant will help fund our Pier Beyond Dock Rail Support Facility, which will significantly expand our rail capacity and enable us to move more containers to the Midwest and beyond directly on rail. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that President Biden signed into law just last November includes another $17 billion for ports and waterways. The funding will allow ports like ours to fast track projects that will speed the movement of goods and allow our ports to grow sustainably. The administration clearly recognizes how important ports, specifically the San Pedro Bay Port Complex, are to the US economy. And these projects are needed, but they will take time. And it's not just infrastructure that needs to be upgraded. This most recent dis disruption is the latest reminder that the US supply chain isn't as elastic as we need it to be. It's time that we take a serious look at transitioning the U.S. supply chain to 24-7 operations. Our trading partners in East Asia are already there. It's time for us to match those operating hours to establish a true end-to-end 24-7 supply chain. And that is why we took the first step here in Long Beach with the first 24-hour terminal operation at our TTI facility. And we will continue to advocate for 24-7 operations, not just at the port, but across the supply chain. There are 168 hours in a week. And for the most part, our terminals are open less than half those hours. Without expanding our terminals and building new facilities, we could handle more cargo simply by utilizing more of those hours. We also need truckers and warehouses to be open at night and go 24 seven. With the Biden administration's help, the framework for 24 seven supply chain operations has been established. And this concludes my opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hasegaba. And now let's turn to Hannah Kane. Welcome, Hannah, CEO, uh, President and CEO of Alum. Thank you, Mary. I'm glad to be here. And thank you for including me on the panel. So uh, answering the question, yes, supply chain shortages and disruptions are going to be with us 
for a long time to come, and uh, it is going to impact the economy. Uh, so every time you have shortages, of course, it impacts the pricing and that impacts in play inflation. So right now we are in a seller's market and that drives up inflation. So um, I do think though that it's a very uh, naive uh, look at the world to say that it's a pandemic, uh, that it's due to the pandemic. So the pandemic made things worse and it certainly started the shift, but it's a long-term shift that has a number of consequences. So if you look in long-term, our population has grown by about 30% and we didn't invest in infrastructure. And we knew we were teetering at the edge of the abyss, both with the infrastructure and with the complexities we are building into the supply chain. And I, let me explain what I mean when I say complexities. So the complexities we have start with that we decided to outsource a lot of products, components and finished goods to other countries. And they again outsourced to other countries. So we have a supply chain that's tremendously complex, spread out over the world with a lot of border crossings, a lot of transportations, uh, transportation. And each time we cross a border, we have a lot of different transactions and a lot of things that can go wrong. That complexity, we have not really been able to manage. So technology has tried to follow, to follow the complexity, but the complexity has outrun the technology. And that again causes us to have a situation where we can't really control the supply chain sufficiently to, to manage what we have built in there. So the complexity also comes from regulations. The regulations are continuing uh, and the regulations are different in different locations. So that contributes to uh, uh, that we need much stronger systems. And then we've got our trade wars and the trade wars really frankly don't help anything in the supply chain. It's shifting regulations, it's shifting uh, um, uh, problems with getting things in and out of countries. And so we are all depending on, on that global trade. Uh, and then of course we have the situation where it becomes very dynamic and certainly uh, COVID is part of that where for instance, uh, just last week, we started uh, demanding that if you're a truck driver coming into the US from Canada and Mexico, then you need to be vaccinated. If you come in on a plane, there's not the same requirement. It becomes really uh, an issue that many truck drivers just don't want to be vaccinated. We have a truck driver shortage. If anybody knows somebody who wants to be a truck driver, you can actually get a $5,000 referral fee for getting the medicine, that's how much of a truck driver shortage we have. Yes, we put, yet we put regulations onto them. So what happened was we had a, a supply chain system that was already strained. And we could see that when we got to holiday seasons, et cetera, how difficult it was to get products through. And then we experienced a volume increase that was tremendous. And that came partially from the pandemic. Right, that instead of traveling, we started spending our money on home electronics and uh, lots of other things. We also had a little bit of a shift in which channel we, we, we uh, bought from. We all cutting up corrugated boxes in the weekend these days, right? Uh, because we buy online, but certainly uh, that's, that's a big issue. So, um, so I think once the pandemic gets resolved, there's going to be some relief on the labor side, but overall the labor side is, is, has shifted, I think, for very good. Um, that I, I think that many people are rethinking their relationship to the labor market. So while we have had some up absences due to COVID, there's also a long-term shift where people are rethinking what they want to work with and do they want to work at all? All right, well, thank you, Hannah Kane, um, for your fascinating remarks. And now let's turn to Dr. Sarah Bohm and welcome to you. Thank you, Mary. It's really an honor to be as part of this discussion today. I, I'd like to 
bring some kind of insights from uh, my research and that of um, other colleagues at PPIC on the experience of kind of individuals and families during this recovery, especially kind of with it, the inflation challenge in mind. And like Dr. Boskin, I have been reflecting on the shape of the recovery. I guess this is how economists think about <laughs> business cycles is to think in shapes and letters. Um, I had been thinking it's something of a W that's kind of petering out with the repeated um, COVID challenges, but improving over time um, and crossing that with something like an S that, that reflects the kind of the diverging realities of, um, uh, of different segments of our economy and our population during the, the pandemic, which has sometimes inverted. So, you know, I won't go any further with that metaphor, but um, I, you know, it brought to mind kind of three insights um, that I think really shed light on how this recovery has been experienced on the ground and, and particularly in California. So I wanted to share these three um, in the time that I have. The, the first is this, this reality that um, economic opportunity has diverged. And you really see that if you think about how inflation has affected different consumers. Prices have gone up about 8% in the Pacific part of the US um, since pre-pandemic. Um, and consumers, of course, have varied ability to cushion against that, depending on their income and what they spend their money on. Uh, lower income households tend to spend more of their resources on basic necessities. And especially at the second half of last year, prices of those items were increasing rapidly. So what we did was look at kind of those spending patterns along with price changes and calculated that um, in order to maintain the same level of consumption um, compared to pre-pandemic, low-income families would need to be spending about $3,000 more today for that kind of basic set of, set of, of goods. And um, that constitutes about a 10% increase um, in their spending. Higher income families spend more, um, even on basics like food. Um, but overall, we estimated, you know, they would see more like an 8% increase in their kind of bottom line to kind of maintain their level of spending. So this is to say that lower income families are kind of facing a higher effective price um, for the, the basic goods that they typically purchase. And so they're kind of needing to um, run faster to keep up um, as inflation um, is, is growing in, in California and the rest of the country. The other diverging reality um, that's prominent on my mind is, is the jobs and, and wages situation in California and the US. Um, despite the good jobs report today, uh, leisure and hospitality jobs are still 10% behind where they were um, in February 2020, and it's a little bit worse in California. Um, it's important because this is a low-wage sector, the largest low-wage sector, but this is where this kind of like inversion occurs is wages are up the most in this low-wage sector. They're up 11%. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not what you would expect in a recovery in a sector where we're still behind in terms of recovering jobs. So an indication that we're in a tight labor market, as others have alluded to, um, that's affected not just by kind of the, the realities of the needs of businesses, but also where workers are choosing to, to, to work. Um, the second uh, aspect of this recovery so far that I, I find important to watch is how these shifts are becoming permanent. Um, you know, we have this idea of a V-shaped recovery of bouncing back or, you know, transitory challenges that were occurring. But there are a couple of things that we're watching that suggest that's not the case. The first I wanted to point out is, you know, in, in this, um, the, the strong demand for goods that we're seeing um, among consumers in the U.S., Actually, underlying that is, is a decline in the demand, the relative, a relative decline in the demand for services. Um, of course, you know, this is driving up prices for goods and durables in particular. Um, and it's not clear to me that we'll return to the pre-pandemic kind of um, rate of spending on services versus goods. In part, that's because of this workforce challenge um, that we see in service sectors like leisure and hospitality, but also because where people work and live has shifted. And we, we don't know how much, uh, how much of that will be permanent, but I expect some of it will be. And, and at a minimum, that changes where the demand for these kind of service spending will be. Um, for example, per, potentially less so in urban business districts compared to kind of where we were in early 2020. And of course, related to that is the, the shift to remote work. And the, the best estimates that I'm aware of suggest 25% of full paid work days um, after the pandemic will be 
will be done remotely compared to 5% beforehand. That is a massive shift, um, you know, and with a relatively tight labor market, I think those shifts in preferences among workers um, could become more permanent and could put pressure on wages, um, even in sectors, uh, or especially maybe in sectors where the work can't be done remotely, like in the transportation sector, um, as Hannah, Hannah was talking about the challenges there. And the third and last kind of aspect that um, is, in my mind, important to watch and understand in terms of how people on the ground are, um, you know, coping is the government response um, that, that Dr. Boskin talked a lot about um, that really shook up the shape of the recovery that we had. Um, estimates suggest that poverty actually declined in 2020 um, about by about 23% in the US and California. That's a massive decline um, in, in, a, in also kind of a massive <laughs> recession. Um, and the, the research suggests that the federal stimulus had the largest impact there followed by the unemployment insurance expansions in 2020. In 2021, the child tax credit was a major driver there and really created a, a very different recession and recovery period compared to kind of recessions and business cycles in the past where usually kind of lower incomes would fall relatively more and take longer um, to increase. And um, some of that has been um, uh, shallowed substantially. Of course, most of this kind of direct government support to taxpayers and, and consumers has ended um, which may be good news um, in terms of the kind of pressure that it may have been putting on prices. Um, and government spending going forward is at least on the face, a lot of it directed towards the kind of things that can fuel underlying economic growth like infrastructure spending or in, in California, um, uh, additional investments in training and education. But you know, at the same time for lower income workers, with the kind of uh, elimination of these programs, their ability to continue to meet the kind of high prices um, that we're experiencing, especially if that is to continue is, is definitely a challenge. And uh, in my mind is worth considering kind of what we've learned about targeting through uh, government programs over the past two years um, uh, in order to address and help push in um, for, for those in the economy who are kind of experiencing the di diverging realities that we've seen over the past two years. And I'll end there. Thank you, Mary. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Bone, and thanks to all of our panelists. Now, I'd like to uh, reach out to Dr. Boskin and ask you to give your comments on what you just heard. And any, any questions that you might have? And thank you, Mary, and thank you, Noel, and Anna, and Sarah, for some excellent presentations. Uh, first of all, for those of us that study the overall economy, including Sarah, Hearing from people who are actually dealing with it on the ground, where we're just kind of trying to guess how the rate at which these will improve, uh, it gives some uh, some solace that the people working their tails off to do this are on top of it and doing everything they can uh, in difficult circumstances. I'd make a couple of comments um, uh, with respect to these presentations. One is um, there's not just uh, the supply chain issue now and for the next year, 18 months, but we're going to be reconsidering. Uh, our global supply chains, our firms, our national defense industry, et cetera. And we're gonna be looking to diversify. I think many, many firms have found that being either solely or heavily reliant on a sole source supplier of something where they have something that has, even a pencil has lots of parts, but has you know, several dozen parts and one little thing doesn't show up and they can't actually produce it. And they've had, they have to do a workaround or they have to find another pr producer on short notice. So we're gonna see a gradual um, reallocation of the global supply chain in part away from China for various reasons, sole source, and also for some in the defense industry, national security concerns. Um, and so this is gonna be a continuing challenge that I'll have to keep an eye on. Second thing is this is the second, um, the second period in recent times uh, that we've seen a, um, a lessening of some measures of inequality, current market income, because we count the cash the government gave uh, to people and there was a lot of it and it was more, proportionally more important for people toward the bottom. A lot of it was saved, but it, it gave them a cushion, as I said, at least humanitarian, if it wasn't uh, super helpful in the very short run to the economy. And uh, the period in 2017, 18, 2017, 18 and 19, 
It was the first time in decades that the traditional measures of inequality fell, another time of a quite strong labor market. So um, while it's very helpful to run a strong labor market, we don't want to get in situations where we're so focused on that, we generate a lot of inflation, and then we have lots of problems later, because that can wind up, as it has in the past, hurting the people who are most vulnerable if we have a sharp downturn. They're usually the first laid off. Um, and we won't, you know, we don't have a huge amount of fiscal capacity left if, uh, God forbid, something happened in the relatively short term that required a lot of uh, government intervention, we'd be less able to do it. And as Sarah indicated, we need to learn from what worked and what didn't and target things a lot more effectively. That was, in my view, the biggest problem. Things were spread so broadly that um, for, for a lot less, we could have helped the people who really needed it more. Um, and so we, we need to learn how to do that better. We also need to learn how to deliver the services and we need to add to our notions of um, how much we spend as a measure of what we're doing to how effective that spending is. And uh, you know we've seen that we have a lot of spending in some schools, for example, that aren't doing very well. It's not just the school or the teacher's fault, it's the multifaceted. Um, so just throwing money at something doesn't mean you're going to improve it or you're going to get a decent bang for the buck and it's something that would be supportable long term and makes sense long term. So that's all I would add. But I, I think that adding this kind of um, kind of getting at the details uh, really, really fleshed out what I had to say and was a great compliment to it. So thanks to all the panelists. Agreed. Connecting all the dots here. So thanks again to all of you as well. So um, I have a few questions and I see some here from the audience and remind the audience to continue to post um, their questions. So I'll, I'll go to you, uh, Dr. Hasegaba. And you know, Hannah was speaking about that some of these problems already existed. You know, they were exacerbated by um, the pandemic and that sort of thing. So I'm curious about um, investment in innovation, technology and infrastructure. You, you spoke to that. Um, what is really going to be the most transformative um, in, in that sense? And I recall reading something about the supply chain information superhighway program or something. So how, how, what role is really that innovation going to play here? In yeah, thanks for the question. Long term. Long -term. Yeah, first of all, I, I, I concur with, uh, you know, with Hannah's assessment. A lot of the issues that we're wrestling with today our legacy issues. Uh, the only difference, of course, is the pandemic exacerbated them and really heightened them. Um, and we've had disruptions in the past. The difference between past disruptions and this one is that it halted the entire supply chain end to end all at the same time. But to get to, get to your question about transformative, transformative investments, you know, we're very encouraged by the administration's response to the supply chain crisis. Clearly, our ports and our infrastructure across the nation has been severely underinvested. And this uh, infrastructure law is going to help close that gap so that we can be competitive at a global scale, but more importantly, be able to handle the volumes that are coming our way. The other piece of that, however, is as technology evolves, one of the key lessons coming away from the supply chain crisis is the lack of visibility, the lack of information sharing. The supply chain is a system of systems, and you've got a number of discrete business entities, thousands literally, that are crisscrossing each other, intersecting each other to move a container from point A to point B. And one of the things that we really need to fix as we upgrade our physical infrastructure is our digital infrastructure. So the Port of Long Beach in December announced a new initiative that we believe will get us there. Uh, we're building what we call a digital infrastructure. We're calling it the Supply Chain Information Highway. And what this will do, Mary, is it will create a corridor, a common corridor for all existing portals and platforms that are being developed both in the public and private sector for visibility as visibility tools to be able to travel on it. So think of these individual discrete portals as cars carrying data. We're trying to build the digital infrastructure so that all these different vehicles and their data can travel on it. And the end user, the shipper, will have access to that data and they will gain the visibility that they've been wanting all these years. And it answers a very basic question, where is my cargo? And so far, we've gotten a lot of very positive res response, not just from the shippers and the supply chain stakeholders, but also from our state and federal partners. 
That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, Hannah, I'm just uh, curious, anything more that you might want to add to that, but I actually will get into uh, another question is how do you see maybe supply chain issues causing manufacturers to rethink things like just in time purchasing and, and um, those sorts of things. What are some of the uh, perhaps operational uh, trends that we might see change as a result of? Thank you for the question. And I, I agree that we need to have both the physical and, and digital and, and financial supply chains all in sync in order to move forward. Um, today, my main concern for the current supply chain crisis is actually with the American manufacturing industry and especially the small and mid-sized manufacturers. Because as I mentioned, it's seller's market. And, and while we want everybody to near source, certainly meaning moving as much production as we can close to, for instance, the US market, if that's the market we are targeting, um, reality is that even if we use an American manufacturer, they get raw materials from everywhere. And so we need the supply chain to really function and the manufacturer now is in a situation where if they place an order any place in the world, uh, the terms have changed. So many companies now are forced to place orders way out in advance because uh, the lead time is more uncertain and it takes longer time in the water. But many manufacturers also are forced to place a purchase order without a fixed price, where the manufacturers overseas can change the price last minute. And so it's a price that's in effect when they ship. And this creates a huge level of uncertainty. And then many manufacturers overseas also demand payment up front. And now the product will sit on the water and maybe sits uh, outside at, uh, trying to get on a ship from China or wherever that, that thing comes from and then getting into the US. So the transit time has become much longer. Of course, the freight cost has become longer. And now they need to do that with all the components and get everything in before they can convert it to cash. And the problem here is also that the, during this time, the demand shifted. So now there's no guarantee that what they got in actually is something they can convert to cash. And so, so small and mid-sized manufacturers throughout the U.S. are right now facing a cash crisis. They have to build up inventory. They have to place those orders, but there's no guarantee that they can convert it to cash and they're sitting much, much longer on inventory. I'm really concerned about this and the long-term effect and small and mid-sized companies that may not be able to, to, to carry this cash burden. I think uh, larger corporations are in a better situation being able to, to weather the storm, but I'm, con I'm concerned here. And this, of course, is going to impact our competitiveness and the uh, uh, US as such. So it's something for all of us to, to watch. Uh, thank you. And Dr. Bone, what, what would you say is, where are the, the biggest pain points for consumers? I mean, where, where does there need to be um, the greatest amount of relief? The biggest pain point is clearly inflation. I think that dominates everything else, especially for the part of the population whose incomes aren't keeping up with inflation. And as Sarah indicated, a lot of low-income people spend a disproportionate share of their income on the goods that, uh, that have gone up the most, food and energy. Uh, gasoline's a higher fraction of their budget than it is a mine, for example. So, uh, so that's the biggest pain point. And we have to somehow get that under control without, um, uh, without getting it embedded into the economy and people having to deal with that over a long period of time. Uh, that usually doesn't happen uh, with, a, with a super soft glide path landing that has usually not been the history in the past. So fingers crossed the Fed can engineer that. Also the fact that we're not gonna have, at least right now in the short run, a lot of additional spending thrown into the economy above and beyond the many trillions already being spent by the government, uh, at least for right now, is probably a good thing. Whatever the merits of the things that are being proposed right now, we don't need a lot of additional government, uh, government deficit finance. The national debt just passed $30 trillion if we strip out the, the stuff that's owed from one part of the government to another, it's a few trillion less than that. 
Uh, and so every, every, uh, every trillion gets very, very much uh, becomes a drag on the need for higher taxes or less spending in the future. And that will also wind up eventually starting to put some pressure on interest rates in addition to the natural uh, pressure we're seeing in the Fed raising rates. And as interest rates rise, the interest part of the federal budget will rise. And by the Congressional Budget Office projections become quite large by the end of the decade and start to crowd out space we need for other things, for infrastructure, for, uh, uh, for transportation more generally, for um, various grants to state and local governments, uh, for Social Security and Medicare, which face very large shortfalls and are due to have their trust funds run out, uh, uh, Medicare this decade, Social Security uh, a few years later. So we need, we need to get some combination of fis sensible fiscal discipline where we fund the things we really need and we understand some other things may or may not be nice to have, but they're just, they're just not, not in the cards for right now without really upsetting the economy. Uh, I would say that's really the biggest pain point or inflation will wind up getting embedded and will be running at levels that are uh, really problematic for years rather than for a few quarters. You know, when, when the Federal Reserve Chairman or the President says, well, inflation is going to be transitory, uh, to economists, that means maybe it'll be gone in a few quarters or a year and a half or something. So the person that hears that, the typical person dealing with this, they think it means it's going to be gone soon, like in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And so clearly that was way off. However, however much sense that made at the very beginning, when we're comparing to a depressed set of prices and to the supply chain was a big part of it, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, that's no longer the case. We really have to get inflation under control. Yes. If, and so, uh, Sarah, I'd love to hear your um, comments on that and, and also just how you see the impact of inflation sort of adding to that question. So, yeah, I would just add when you look at um, family budgets, especially towards the lower end of the income spectrum, you can't ignore housing even though it may, you know, it, and, and we've seen how it's, that's been a kind of a, a cost increase and challenge for a long time in California, of course, and, and especially in the past two years as well, um, even if it's less affected by kind of some of these supply chain um, and inflation pressures that we're discussing today is, is it plays an outsized role. Um, I would say like overall, when we look at, um, you know, how families are coping with higher prices, um, for those that are working, you know, especially in certain low wage sectors, their wages are probably outpacing um, the, the, the cost that they're, the increased cost that they're facing. Um, it's surprising and heartening that actually if we, um, the Atlanta Fed does a, a nice wage tracker, um, it looks a, a, and it allows us to see how, um, how wages are increasing across the income distribution and the largest increases we've been seeing are in the bottom fourth of the income wage distribution. So that's actually good news, but nonetheless, there are still in California about a million people unemployed and, um, and an, an additional probably three to 400,000 who've dropped out of the labor force. So. Um, need to think about these things in combination and kind of make sure that we're building towards the kind of workforce opportunity um, and access to those jobs where kind of wages are growing um, for, for the long term for these families. Yeah, I might ask you and all of you if there is, um, you know, what are companies doing, but also what are, I guess you could say governments and, and educational institutions doing to, to, to match up job training with um, just basically what we're left with now, you know, the, um, the opportunities that have been opened up by this disruption um, and uh, that, um, you know, from truck drivers to um, all kinds of, of jobs. So anything, what's, what's the job uh, solution that we need? And Sarah, maybe I'll start with you and then we'll kind of run down the I'm sure, I'll, I'll keep it brief. I would just say, you know, from the state perspective, this is a major investment, um, a major piece of the state budget. And I would point to the community college system as a key kind of um, job training system in California that is, you know, over 100 institutions all across the state um, with open access. Um, the challenge in my mind is uh, connecting the training to a future of work that is evolving. Um, that is fast moving as we've seen, um, and that Hannah and Noel know better than I. Um, 
uh, to actually make that function um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of large system um, is, the, is the key challenge, but one that we need to, need to accomplish in order for uh, you know, more equitable, equitable training and access to these jobs. Hiana, do you want to maybe yeah, give the first sure. slide? Seen from an employer standpoint, and especially in supply chain, uh, you've just got, got to grow your own, right? Uh, so supply chain is a place where uh, we, and this is something we have known for a, a long while, is we are about 2 million people short, uh, and uh, they are not coming out of the educational system uh, with the skills that we need. So we just need to, to grow our own. And I think a lot of organizations uh, are thinking that way as well. So we started Alum University to uh, help upskill our, our workforce. And certainly, uh, I think uh, it's a feeding frenzy out there uh, when it comes to skilled uh, skilled. Uh, people and um, and uh, the war on talent is really on and I am a strong believer that whoever is very successful in in getting talent in will win the the war in the in the long run what about you dr Hasegawa um, relative to port and port operations sure uh, first of all let me concur with what Sarah and Hannah already said I agree 100 percent with them. You know, from our vantage point here at the port, workforce development was already a priority before the pandemic. And certainly the pandemic, the great resignation and, and the impacts across the supply chains that relates to workforce has sort of pushed us over the edge. So we're very focused on working with our academic partners with the state government here in California to really come up with a strategic plan on how we can um, develop a workforce development plan, not just for the supply chain, but for the state. I mean, this is something that's critical. Human capital has never been uh, this important. And at the ports here in Southern California, we're committed to doing that. Yeah, right. I would certainly, if I may, Mary, I would certainly agree with most of those comments, at least the spirit of all of them. I would just add a couple of things. One is it's important that any government program of training actually be effective. Uh, for the jobs that are actually going to be there, not for some politicians or bureaucrats dream of what they ought to be, even if that doesn't materialize. So for example, we have the federal government has 46 job training programs spread across nine agencies uh, that spends well over $20 billion a year. So many of them don't even track what happens to the people that leave them. Um, most have poor records. So for spending that money, if we could have a half dozen that actually work and have higher success rates, that would already be a big improvement without having to spend a whole bunch more money. Same for state programs. And most of it's gonna go on the private sector. Uh, certainly the boards of directors I've served on, we take a, we spend a lot of time on our workforce development, not just attracting new workers, but retaining them, giving them uh, opportunities to upgrade their skills and assume uh, greater responsibilities and so on. So I think that's, that's really important. Another key thing I can't resist saying with Noel and Hannah on the line, is we have big, um, we have big uh, infrastructure problems in delivering basic services in our society and the pandemic really revealed that. Clearly there was an immense, you know, 10, 100 times larger need at the very beginning. But we had, for example, the California Employment Development Department a year after COVID hit had a million backlog unemployment insurance claims. People desperate couldn't get their unemployment insurance. Now they have a third of a million disability insurance backlog. Why is that? because they had tens of billions of dollars of fraud the first time. Now, some of that with the rushing the money out probably was inevitable, but you know, that, that was just way off the scale. And why is that going on? We've underinvested in the stuff that really is the, in, the innards, the infrastructure, the plumbing of delivering state services. For example, the EDD's infrastructure is 50 years out of date. It's IT infrastructure. It's, it's got, you know, I don't know how they're gonna keep getting programmers to use the stuff they have. So they were just incapable of dealing with anything even many months later. So we've underinvested in that uh, and diverted too much attention to other things that were not as necessary. And we're gonna have to learn from this and really redouble our efforts to get the basic functions of government working well. Great, well, it's kind of all of this great revelation hopefully will result in great change. So I'm going to, Hannah, I know we're going to wrap it right now. And Hannah, I know you're going to jump right off. So I'm going to let you be the first to answer a final question. And 
really, it's just what is the data? What are the numbers that you're most going to each of you be keeping your eyes on um, in the next uh, year to, to monitor this? Or anything you want to say as a wrap, Hannah? <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly I, I, I'll be looking at inflation and I'm always telling my friends no fixed price contracts anymore. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to be looking at uh, um, the uh, general supply chain, the, the, uh, both, both the disruption in, in the U.S., but also globally. I think that, uh, you know, this is not a U.S. problem. This is a global problem. And so looking at, uh, at uh, transit times, etc. But I'm also, I'm, my, my most positive thing coming out of this uh, supply chain disruption is actually the investment in technology companies in the supply chain space. Uh, and so that's another good metric to, to look at. And it's been very, very positive over the last year. So, uh, so uh, let's end on a good note. Very great. Thank you so much. And Dr. Hasegaba, what your final words and, and what you're going to be watching the closest? Sure, Mayor. Well, in numbers, 20 million TU. The only way the supply chain will be able to handle that amount of cargo is shifting to 24-7 operations. The $17 billion of infrastructure investments by the federal government are going to be critical, but we also need to continue investing in our digital infrastructure. And finally, $150 million is what the two ports in Southern California, along with the state of California, are investing to build a state-of-the-art goods movement workforce training campus to make sure that we have the workforce in the ports to be able to support the supply chain. Very great. And, and Sarah Bone, your final words and what you'll be watching most closely. I'm definitely watching though those uh, inflation numbers right after this, though, so I'm going to be digging my fingers into the jobs numbers that were out today um, for January for the US. Um, so that's kind of what I'm tracking most over time, jobs and wages, uh, in addition to looking at how, uh, you know, enrollment is changing at our higher education institutions. Um, as kind of part of the, the whole pipeline that we'll need to have working together. Um, to, uh, to kind of close some of these gaps that we've talked about today. Great, thank you. And Dr. Boskin, you're looking at numbers and data all the time. What, what, should we be, what will you be watching most closely? Uh, on the macro front, I'll be looking at everything about prices, and not just the overall inflation, but the components of it. Has the increase in housing costs actually caught up with, and or is it currently being measured? Or is there gonna be more inflation coming, even if prices don't go up a lot more? Um, what's going on earlier in the supply chain and producer prices, what's going on in prices as they leave ports as well as container shipping. Uh, you can't understand the American economy anymore. You can't just look at our unemployment rate or our inflation rate without understanding what's going on in the rest of the world, partly because of trade and supply chains, uh, partly because of globalization, uh, but also for financial flows. Um, so that's number one, but I'm also going to be um, paying a lot of attention down, down into the innards of employment data and what's going on in firms and how they're coping, uh, how they're diversifying. And then lastly, I never expected to understand the economy that I'd have to become quite an expert in virology. And that's unfortunately the case. And so I spent a lot of time talking to experts at Stanford and UCSF trying to understand the data, tracking what's going on in other countries with this new subvariant of Omicron that uh, has taken over in some countries, which seems to be even more transmissible, but even less virulent. So if that's the case, hope, and it's here now, it's very minor here, but if that takes over, let's hope that holds up. Uh, but, uh, you know, it used to be um, that you didn't have to be a, a health economist to be a macroeconomist, but now, now you do, unfortunately. Um, so let's hope that the trend of Omicron cases declining, not as fast as they spike, but declining, uh, and this new data, and that continues, and that hospitalizations and deaths, which are a lower percentage, but because the cases are larger, have started flooding our hospitals and so on, that those decline, and let's hope that um, you know, we manage in the future to make this an endemic we can more easily live with, and we can learn from the tensions we've had uh, many of them politicized, but many of the tensions that we've had between employers and employees, between federal government and state government, between red states and blue states, between 
the health experts and the economists, that we learn from all of this. And the most promising thing I've heard on that front was a study that came out of Johns Hopkins that suggested um, that natural immunity has, uh, has actually been very, very helpful and seems to be more durable than the, even than the vaccine immunity. So let's hope that's true. And if uh, this case proves out, we'll be talking less next year at the Walter Hoadley luncheon than about health than we are now. All right, well, thank you for um, wrapping us up on a very hopeful note. And thanks to all of you for this timely and important conversation on the economy. Thanks to Dr. Bosca for your insightful remarks. And I wanna thank uh, Dr. Noel Hasigaba, Hannah Kane, and Sarah Bone for joining us today and for adding your tremendous insights. Our sincere thanks to Bank of America for supporting this program. We so value a partnership that stretches back between the two organizations for many decades. The video from today's program will soon be found on the Commonwealth Club's website at www.commonwealthclub.org and on our national radio broadcast and podcast. I'm Mary Huss, President and Publisher of San Francisco Business Times and Silicon Valley Business Journal. Thanks to all of you. And this Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned. <laughs>